All right, everyone. I was just going to say by my clock, we have a minute. Um, so I'm going to give it that minute. Uh, so Teresa, you have uh, um, as well as uh, um, Zoom open or uh, do we, okay. Yeah, so, I have Zoom. Yeah, so if we see any questions in the chat, we'll just put it in the question and answer so that you can pick them up. Okay. I like the question and answer uh, place because people can also upvote and that. Yeah, I agree. Really nice. <laughs> I definitely want to make use of the upvote feature. And, you know, the Whova app probably won't um, update for me unless I keep going in and out. So I'm just going to rely on you to to. OK, to bring up the questions. Is, is that OK, good? so me and Nick are both here. So in case any question is getting missed, we can. Yeah, you can you can yell at me. <laughs> All right, well, I think it's about time for us to get started. Um, welcome everyone to the first half of maintaining the taxonomic backbone or connecting those who try. Um, before we get started, I wanna remind everyone that the session is being recorded and to ask the speakers to please speak slowly and clearly. Attendees, please post your questions in the the Whova Q&A application so that others can uh, vote up your questions and questions that don't get answered within our sessions can be answered and reviewed later. Um, if time permits between presentations, we'll address presentation specific questions. Otherwise, we'll hold them to the end when we have some time for discussion. Um, and we ask that everybody please follow the conference code of conduct. So we were very surprised at the level of interest that this symposium garnered, and we hope that these presentations and conversations can put us one step farther along the path to a taxonomic backbone. Um, so let's get started. Our first speaker today is Peter Utes. He's an associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, and his talk is titled The Reptile Database Curating the Biodiversity Literature Without Funding. All right. Take over. <clears throat> so thank you very much for the um, opportunity. And I would like to um, talk about curating the biodiversity literature, which means how do we get information out of the literature into databases? This is a bit different from what some people understand by the word um, curating. I heard that some people think that curation for them means more like organizing and managing the literature references and the bibliographies, but we really are interested in the actual information, how to get the information from papers into uh, um, databases. So the, the reptile database is one of those 150 or so databases that provide the taxonomic backbone for the catalog of life and many other databases. And I will talk a little bit about these uh, connections um, in a few minutes. So just as a reminder, reptiles are about 11,000 or 12,000 species out of the 2 million species that are in the catalog of life. And they make up only half a percent of all the species in the catalog of life. And that's just in relation to the other 60,000 or so vertebrate species, just to put everything in perspective. So all the vertebrates are only three or you know, 4% of all the species we currently know about. Um, also, as a reminder, that when we talk about reptiles, we mostly talk about snakes and lizards, you know, like everything else, like crocodiles and turtles and blah, blah, blah. There are just a few percent we can, so we can always almost ignore that stuff. So you just know what I'm talking about. Also, it's also maybe notable that the number of species in reptiles is similar to the one to the species number in birds. It's about 12,000. But there are interesting uh, differences, namely um, that birds have many more subspecies. And that already indicates that there are, there are cultural or sociological differences, I would argue. So some people would have said that we can you know, consider these subspecies as real species and just basically give up the subspecies concept. 
And in birds, that would simply double the number of species. In reptiles, there is actually a strong trend to do exactly that, which may be a reason why we have much fewer species overall, uh, much fewer subspecies. And you can see like within the past 10 years, a third of all subspecies have become species, why, which is why the subspecies number continually declines over time. Um, that, that doesn't mean there's fewer species of all. Actually, the herpetologists have described about a thousand species over, over the past five years or so. And you can see these are the numbers of years that have been used to add another thousand species. And you can see over the past 50 years or so, these like intervals have become shorter and shorter. Like 50 years ago, it, it maybe took about 20 or you know, 15 years and so on to describe another thousand species, only interrupted by the two world wars. But now we literally add another thousand species every five years or so. So the, the, the speed is actually increasing, not decreasing. And that causes other problems. So for example, so over the past five years also, besides having another thousand new species, like oh, another thousand more species have changed their names. So that means within five years, 20% of all species names are new or, or have changed their names. And I don't know if that's true for other taxonomy groups. I think it's insane. And obviously it will affect all of you guys who deal with all the data and um, managing names and mapping names to collections or whatever other data sets. So I think this is an important problem we have to keep an eye on. So as a, as, as, um, um, a matter of context, the reptile database, of course, not only uh, collects names and synonyms of all these species, they also have type information. They have a fairly big literature database and you have of course, links to other databases. On top of like real descriptions, like diagnosis of species, we have lots of pictures and stuff, distribution data. All the distribution data is, is not our main concern because we have collaborators who uh, take care of that. And you know, people at GBIP and other places uh, focus more on these kind of issues. So um, again, as a reminder, all these links to other databases are important, you know, because we have to maintain the names. Like for example, look at DNA sequences. So if the names in the reptile database change, they also should change for the species in NCBI. They also should change in conservation sites like the IUCN Red List or the iNaturalist um, citizen science pages. So um, we have to keep an eye on all the names and all that stuff too. So now the question is, how do we get the information from the papers, books, or even uh, websites into the database? And the first step for doing that is we have to find the actual literature. And like many other people in taxonomy databases, we have um, used journal tables of contents uh, to find the papers, Google alerts, we correct authors directly, social media and so on. But you all know that the problem is that um, when you do that, you, you have a lot of redundant and non-relevant information. So if you look at a typical journal of um, journal table of contents, maybe one of the papers is relevant for your database or taxonomy group while the others are not. So we have to figure out a way to do this better. Um, and you know, another problem is like with the new electronic forms of publications, we also see um, that of course, this whole thing system changes. We have online versus print publications. So just for each paper, you may have multiple versions with different years of publication. For example, pagination changes. We have in many cases, no DOI, so it's difficult to track and so on and so forth. Um, so Rod Page tried to um, implement the solution for that problem many years ago. Unfortunately, it's not um, active anymore as I know, and maybe he can chime in if he's in the audience, I'm not sure. But so his tool did try to find references for particular topics, but again, it's not working anymore. So we, we try to implement the, uh, a, a new tool to do that. It's not quite ready for uh, prime time, but I just want to mention it. So this was done by Olaf Foss, a programmer in Hamburg in Germany, who, uh, who basically uses cross ref tracking. So we also have all the DOIs and the electronic sources for papers. So what he's doing or what he has implemented is he uses the tax name. So you can really provide a list of hundreds or thousands of family or genus names. 
And then we also use journal names, okay, as the primary filter, but you can, you can also use this as an optional thing. And so he can run his tool on Crossfed like daily or weekly or whatever, and you uh, then get a, a computer readable reference list of papers which have your keywords and the DOIs. So we are still experimenting with that. If you're interested, let me know. So you're welcome to try this as well. So the, the, the bottom line is you get a list of papers which you then have to, of course, still look through and get the information out. So in the reptile database right now, we add about 2000 papers a year, um, which is a lot of stuff to read. So we cannot do all this stuff ourselves. But so what we, what we want to do, we want ideally an automatic system that uh, curates or extracts all the information from these papers. But unfortunately, most journals don't allow us to do that. There are some like the, Pens of papers, which have some formatting, which actually allows to do that. So that's the first step, but most of them don't. So as, a, as an intermediary step, what we are doing right now, we try to just send forms to authors like semi-automatically and they fill out the forms. And once you get them back, we can import all that stuff into the reptile database um, and create tables and stuff like this. But in most cases, you'll still have to go through a lot of papers, manually read it, copy and paste stuff and put it into the database. And I mean, obviously this is not just like our problem. The catalog of life has at least 30 species databases, which have more than 10,000 species. And I'm, I'm pretty sure they have the same problem. And then there's all the other databases which have uh, smaller numbers of species, but still, you know, maybe they can do this manually, but maybe not. Um, I want to point out there is actually an international curation for biocuration, which is in fact, just focusing on this very problem, like curation data from papers and other sources. And I, I know there's very few taxonomists in this uh, society. So I would like to invite you to join the society or maybe one of the curation workshops we are planning to do. So the idea is to organize a workshop soon um, that basically deals with the problem, how we can get this information specifically from the biodiversity literature into our databases. And of course, that could also lead to grants and um, having more funding for this kind of stuff. Um, and that's basically already what I wanted to say. So if you are interested in either the workshops or the uh, uh, literature extraction finding tools, please get in touch or let me know through the Vova app. And um, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Peter. That was super informative. I definitely learned something and also laughed at some of your slides because I feel your pain. Um, Nick, BJ, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, there is a question. Uh, is there help for your task from Plazi efforts? Well, not yet, but it's on my to-do list. I, I, I actually sent a message to Donut uh, already earlier today. So we have to work with the Plasti guys because I'm sure they have a bunch of tools at hand, which we can use and many other databases, taxonomic databases can use. So absolutely. Okay, uh, there is one more question. Uh, is there an API for the database? We have an API and it's mostly used for extracting um, 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 species names. So a couple of these outside databases such as Calphotos use that just to check their naming. Um, I think uh, iNaturalist and other sites don't use it yet, but you can use it if you're interested. There's some documentation on our website. Uh, one more question. Have you considered uh, uh, more crowdsourcing for your paper curation? Yeah, so the crowdsourcing is, is so we have a bunch of um, volunteers who help with curation and we also, so we have a newsletter, so we email basically the community. So it goes out to four or 5,000 people and a lot of people send stuff back. So we do get a lot of emails from people. So it, it, is, a, it is a crowdsource um, system in a way. I mean, we have a bit, we have been reluctant to open it up to do it like wiki style. So we have many curators who can edit data directly. As I mean, as you all know, this is a problem because there are very many different opinions about taxonomy, and we have to keep this standardized to some extent. So that's why it's 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 one of these challenges we as database curators have to deal with. But I, I don't think there's a really good solution yet. But if any of you guys has ideas, let me know. 
Uh, I think that that's all questions right now. All right, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Okay, our next speaker is Ronel Klopper um, from the South African National Plant Checklist. Um, and her presentation will be uh, titled The South African National Plant Checklist, Maintaining the Taxonomic Backbone for a Mega Diverse Country. Um, and her presentation is recorded. So Avery, if you could play that for us, thank you. processes and very briefly touch on challenges faced in updating the backbone. But first, a bit of background to set the scene. The flora of Southern Africa or FSA region shown here in the map is a hotspot of botanical diversity. It harbors the richest temperate flora in the world and is home to about 6% of the world's plant diversity, including an entire floristic region. 50% of the vascular flora of Africa, as well as 50% of continental endemics occur in Southern Africa, which is less than 10% of the total land area of the continent. 50% of known succulent plants of the world occur in Southern Africa. And within this diverse region, South Africa is considered to be a mega diverse country, harboring 381 families, over 2,600 genera and over 21,000 species, of which around 20,000 are indigenous, with a species level endemism of 60%. Although southern African plants appeared sporadically in herbals and catalogues from as early as 1605, one of the first catalogues to include a large number of southern African plants was that by Berman. But probably the first publication to focus entirely on South Africa was the first Flora Capensis by Linnaeus on the 502 species of plants that early collectors had sent to him from the Cape of Good Hope. Later, Karl Thunberg, a student of Linnaeus, visited the Cape and described the plants he had collected, of which over a thousand were new to science. Several taxonomic treatments followed, including the well-known Flora Capensis of Harvey and Sonder, and several volumes from, from the Flora of Southern Africa series, to name but a few. Computerization of information from these and numerous other sub-publications started when the Precy database was developed in the 1970s. The next few slides will illustrate how outputs of the backbone developed over the years. The first output contained a simple list of accepted names of southern African plants. The second edition also included synonyms and references to recent literature. And updates to the backbone was regularly published in the journal Bothalia. Several updated, annotated versions of the checklist was published and eventually these included regional distribution, life cycle, life form, plant height, and altitude. The annotated Southern African backbone was made available online in 2006. And two website upgrades saw the additions of plant images, distribution maps, and text from the flora of Southern Africa volumes and updates were regularly made up to February 2013. During this time, data from Precy was migrated to a Brahms platform, and the plant database was renamed as the Botanical Database of Southern Africa, or BODATSA for short. Following migration, the POSA website was also redeveloped and relaunched in 2016. For the first time, it included specimen level information, thus aligning with global efforts to mobilize plant biodiversity data. And updates are posted at the beginning of each quarter. 
Also available on Forza is an official yearly release of the South Africa National Plant Checklist. This is also disseminated on Sandby's institutional repository, together with documents like the checklist policy, the classification system followed, and annual reports on changes and additions made to the backbone. The South African taxonomic backbone and the closely associated eFlora of South Africa projects also feed into global initiatives like the African Plant Database that produced the first ever taxon backbone for Africa, as well as the World Flora Online project. Now remember that Southern Africa harbors 6% of the world's flora, of which over 60% are endemic to the region. So we provide an important proportion of unique data towards this global initiative. The taxon backbone covers indigenous and naturalized plants occurring in South Africa. And groups that are currently covered are the mosses, liverworts, and hornworts, the lycopites and ferns, the gymnosperms, and the angiosperms. And we are in the process of also adding the marine macroalgae. Maintenance of indigenous taxa was always prioritized in the taxonomic backbone, but recently the scope was extended to also focus more on our naturalized flora. Thus far, this data set has been managed differently, and this will likely need to continue going forward, with an emphasis on presence or absence and confirmation of naturalized or invasive status. A single standard family level classification is followed for each group in the backbone. For the mosses, hornwoods, and liverworts, the following publications and updated websites are used. For the ferns, lycophytes, and the gymnosperms, these are the publications that are followed. Now, the family level classification that is followed for the angiosperms is a bit more complex. The classification followed is based on APG2 with the bracketed families recognized at family level. Now, bracketed families were tentatively included in other families, but you have the option to still recognize them in APG2, which we have done. However, in APG3 and 4, most of these bracketed families were synonymized, but we prefer to still recognize them. New families that were described after APG2 are included as well as any additional families that were recognized in APG 3 and 4. However, where families that was recognized in APG 2 were synonymized, we continue to recognize them at family level. This decision was widely discussed and concurred among South African botanists. And from a Southern African perspective, it makes more sense to treat smaller families rather than the large families of APG 3 and 4. Many of the contentious bracketed families of APG 2 and later lumpings have their centers of diversity in Southern Africa. And the classification followed in the South African taxon backbone is better suited to our flora. We, for instance, prefer to treat a narrowly defined Asparagaceae Ruscaceae and Hyacinthaceae at family level, rather than the single large and heterogeneous Asparagaceae of APG 3 and 4. This deviation from APG 4 is well documented, and it is easy to amend our outputs to follow APG 4 families where needed. There is a clear policy and strategy that guides how updates are done and which groups should be prioritized. Two staff members with a sound knowledge and understanding of plant nomenclature and literature take full responsibility for maintaining the backbone. Only published changes are incorporated. And the latest published evidence-based treatment for a taxon is followed. Where competing classifications exist, these are referred to the South African Plant Checklist Committee for consideration. This committee is comprised of qualified taxonomists from various South African institutions. 
Now, maintaining the tax on backbone of a mega diverse country comes with certain challenges. One of these is finding the required literature. But with numerous sources providing access to literature online, this is becoming less problematic. However, several old South African publications and numerous obscure journals are not yet available online. It seems to be difficult to reach all your end users. Even though up-to-date information is available online and widely publicized, some people still use old and outdated sources. And keeping up with all the published changes in new taxa with only two people doing updates is likely our biggest challenge. So we are looking at options to streamline our processes even more. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Ronel. BJ and uh, Nick, do we have any questions? No questions right now. So I can see a little bit of convergence between our first and second talk um, and getting those names out of literature and maintaining updated lists um, is a challenge. Ronel, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, not really. But yeah, it was interesting to hear Peter's talk and see exactly our similar problems in his talk. So yes, it's it's a mutual problem that many people um, updating backbones have, I suppose. But it's it's good to know that we're not alone with with that issues we're facing. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is part of the reason we decided to organize this. We wanted everybody to know that we're kind of fighting the same battles. We had a question roll in. Oh. Uh, the question is, can you describe the human resources that are available and are there positions exclusively for this work? Um, I hope I understand the question correctly. Um, like I said, there's two people um, um, updating the backbone physically in the database. So, um, yeah, it's basically two people doing the work, but the information comes from various sources. There's um, colleagues and the people writing the papers. We've got a good network of people that regularly send us their papers, which helps a lot that we don't need to search for it. But we also, similar to Peter, do um, Google alerts and look at journal um, tables to, to, to keep up to date with literature. And we regularly interrogate at least once a year the in, in International Plant Names Index to make sure what, what, what we've missed. But yes, yeah, so human capacity is one of our big problems. And neither of these posts are exclusively to update the backbones. Both of us has got other um, things that we need to do as well, research and admin and all sorts of other things. So it's it's less than 50% of our time that we spend actually on the backbone, although I think both of us can spend 100% and still not get everything done. <laughs> but we try our best. But it's, it's good that the network that we have that supports us, that sends us information and helps us check the outputs, that, that really helps a lot. Yeah, thanks for that. I was going to ask, is this a full time job or something that you're only part? So really, you have one person between you that are doing this. It's, it's actually in terms of person hours. It's just one person doing yeah. the job. You're absolutely correct. Yes. Got you. Yeah, there's always a shortage of people, it seems. OK. Next, we have uh, William Ulate. He's the data manager at the World Flora Online at the Missouri Botanical Garden. And he will be talking to us about challenges, solutions, and workflows developed for the taxonomic backbone of the World Flora Online. And Avery has, is recorded. My name is William Lattie, I'm the project manager at the Center for Biodiversity Informatics in the IT division of the Missouri Botanical Garden. 
And I'm here representing my colleagues for the World Forum Online project. And we would like to present our experience with the World Forum Online Taxonomy Backbone. As you may know, the plan list was created in 2010 through the collaboration of large, large databases created by the work of the Royal Botanical Garden of Kew, the Missouri Botanical Garden, among others. And as a result of the first target one of the global strategy for plants conservation. The plant list was a working list of all plant species known. Its objective was to be an integration of all vascular plants and bryophytes, but it has been static since 2014, and it requires an update. World from Nines is organized in the framework of a consortium of institutions which have signed a memorandum of understanding open for signature on January 2013. The consortium currently comprises a total of 47 worldwide partner institutions, and they meet on a regular basis with 17 meetings held to date. The World Forum Online considers the entire plant world, starting from biophytes to manage sperms, and it must be free access over the internet. It presents a consensus classification to facilitate the understanding of the plant world by non botanists. In order to achieve this goal, the project needs the expertise of collaborative networks of individuals and of the taxonomists, and to develop the consensus classification as well as descriptive data from published works. The objective is to provide information that contributes to a better comprehension of the plant situation in a changing environment. The consortium is organized in three main entities, a World uh, uh, Council that meets twice per year and decides on strategic matters, and three subgroups, the Taxonomic Working Group, dealing with classification and taxonomy, uh, the Think of Working Group, dealing with the architecture of the database, of the website, and any uh, development of tools, and the communication working group that facilitates the communication among members of the council working groups in the public. Holy Portal was developed by the Missouri Botanical Garden based on the Monocot Portal channel offered by the Royal Botanical Gardens Cube. It was initially populated with a plan based taxonomic backbone and augmented by new taxonomic sources like soil and acid source. It was launched on July 2017 during the International Botanical Congress in Shenzhen, China. The major new version of the website and the taxonomic data is planned for the end of this year, thanks to the valuable collaboration of uh, colleagues from the Royal Botanical Gardens of Edinburgh. Now, even when it was a great start for a project, it was made clear from the beginning that the eMonocrate portal was provided as it was. No support, no documentation, no manuals, basically only the code. To understand how it works, we have to consider that the portal is logically divided in two parts, the taxonomic backbone and the descriptive content. Descriptive content can be textual descriptions, images, geographic distribution, geographic distributions, identification of keys, and itemized data like trait status, life forms, or habitat. Here's a high-level diagram of the system being developed. And here's a list of 37, 38 approved taxonomy expert networks. The current infrastructure is in the Google Cloud platform, thanks to a donation received from Google by New York Botanical Garden and contributed to the project. We have set our testing stage and production environment there. Here's a simplified workflow diagram of the process of updating the taxonomy backbone from the contributions of taxonomy expert groups as providers. Note that beyond a clinical check of the format in which the data is contributed, we need to validate or assign new government findings to an existing or new name distributed. This process is what we call the name matching. Also note that the contributor is always provided with feedback on the result of the process, since we will want them to update the records with the W4ID assigned. This new globally unique ID was assigned to all known plants names in the WFO, including both vascular and non-vascular plants. And these IDs were also cross referenced with identifiers from those plant names, included in, uh, in IBNI and PPL. In order to do the matching, and while a more definitely robust solution was provided by our colleagues, we developed a temporary name matching tool only for internal use. 
As some of you may know, you may guess now, the tool is still pending to be developed and we have had to extend our temporary solution to cope with newer and bigger needs. These are the major steps in the work for online ID name matching process. As usage is incremented, we had to fine tune the name matching algorithms guiding the results. Here, for example, are some of the considerations of different endings in names. Processing data is being classified into match, near match, main match, and not match, and in some cases, even repetition. The output is the, the process is uh, the same comes provided plus a W4ID and any comment that to provide an insight of what happened. As one would expect, what started as a simple idea has become a whole process, but gladly our tent manager, Alan, Alan Elliott, is in charge of working directly with the tents and different specialists to figure out some of those non-match reports. One strong recommendation is that we use tool, existing tools or adapt them. We use the GBF Diamond Core Archive Validator to check the file before harvesting. This tool catches most of the basic errors. Of course, constant use of the chosen formats and tools allows the team to develop the expertise that speeds up the results and facilitates the resolution of even the most cryptic errors. The same goes on for the port in one of the portal. After several years of harvesting and working with this tool, we have familiarized ourselves with the part that knows the taxonomy of backbone and descriptive content. Much of these required conditions from the point of view of the provider have been added into three guidelines for data providers, the boxes in yellow there. And they are the go-to reference when a new user wants to know something about the format, processes, and other information. But the eMonocode system is a old system. It implies that legacy code could easily become outdated and affect its functionality. Here are the sources we have used to update the higher level classification of the taxonomic backbone. This is a process that anyone who's to handling the taxonomic backbone knows about this merging of checklists, comparing with others to uh, improve the, the pattern that we have. In this case, is it be before, it would be one, and so on. As with any major update, we have to review the consistency of our database because it gave errors as to indicate them. From the checks that we do in the pre harvest database, we review the synonymy, the family, and major groups assignments. We also never delete any record. Once it has a WFID, we exclude it. But then there's rules about what could be excluded and how the relation to the rest of the taxonomy. Also included some minor checks for empty fields where there should be a value, reference to exclude names, and so on. Last in this year, we have been very busy doing several of these merge of checklists. In this case, this is uh, the WCVP, the World Checklist of Vascular Plans, um, added to do more for online. Note that even when some of them are uh, both the W4 and WCVP, they can be an exact match or they could have actually different values in family, taxonomic standards, authors, and publications. This is the same situation with the INI ID and the WCP. Some of the names with INI ID and both WCP and WCP may have different INI IDs. This is a representation that out of the 1,356,000 records and names in WCP, only 810,000. We're actually being able to uh, try and match uh, to something that we, we do have. And of course, this means that uh, those reports that come out, the uh, differences in yellow, have to be reviewed in some of the checklists like a POA or even, and even then you can see how they might be different or have some differences that in some cases are quickly resolved by the providers, in some are not. Um, but it, it also 
uh, who buys them every time that we do this again, we have to check for those errors. Here's the results of mean matching. We have 82% of the mean matching world from line and medium names, and 84 obviously with two names and W flow. But in reality, we have a coverage of in the that went from 65% to 92%. And the nomenclator coverage is currently 89%. It would count tropical sign B as the nomenclator for biophytes. This relation between different checklists allows us to do things like this, but this is the period of entry points online that takes the uh, ID of one other list, like Indian or TPL, and returns the corresponding record in World War I. Also, here's an example of where new names are coming from. Last year, new names were not only coming from this process of uh, incorporating the higher taxonomy and the WCVP data set, but also from new names are coming from flooded floras. Particularly, new endemics um, are coming in from uh, different providers like uh, Flora of Madagascar, <coughs> Flora of Brazil, Flora of Africa Central. Uh, South Africa and Colombia. You also track down the issue of uh, two names with one in the identifier, for example, that came with some of the sources, in this case, TPL. This is a publication we had last year where um, the process of placing the taxonomies in the heart of this, of this whole uh, endeavor is explained in detail. Well, a couple of things that I want to mention now is that we have uh, provided a way to download data, a snapshot of the data, and this is really important because in a way people are able to take it as a ZZ0 and use it, um, which is our objective of this process. Um, and also, they can take it and develop new tools. For example, this work for our package allows main matching using the uh, data from workflow. The article that we tracks here. Finally, we are in the process of uh, publicizing endpoints in the API inherited by, from eMonica um, to the workflow online portal. This allows us to get the uh, country directly um, to programming from Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, William. BJ, do we have any questions in the? Yes, we do have several questions for William. First one is, uh, uh, what is your Google Cloud footprint in terms of uh, data volume, network bandwidth, input and output, as well as computer power? And the next part of the question is also, what would be your monthly bill if you had to pay uh, by regular rates. Um, I'm not. I don't know exactly how how big that is. The numbers are. Um, we do have around twenty servers in Google Cloud because we have uh, an environment repeated three times plus other servers around. So you can imagine that it, it does require uh, some some expense. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know how much the bill is per month. Um, uh, this is handled by New York. Um, I do know that uh, we made a calculation and the grant that we had from Google would have finished this September, this past September, uh, because it really, it, it really gets uh, uh, down quickly. And um, uh, we are looking into ways of how to cope with this. Uh, uh, Dr. Wise Jackson from, from the Missouri Botanical Garden here Said he will cover this in the meantime while we find a solution. But yes, it is a consideration actually that um, it's it's great to have it like that, and it gives us peace of mind because I never have to harvest or do anything in the production uh, environment. But then it means that I have to have at least two copies, three, um, if I'm going to test anything um, exactly the same, and 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 that really it's a lot. Um, we have talked about uh, dividing this between our the partners, uh, the, the colleagues. Uh, 
it's still it's one for the other. Then we're going to have to deal with things like uh, delays and, and uh, um, replication and things like that. Okay, the next question is, uh, uh, do uh, WFO IDs resolve to machine readable content? Sorry, say again? Uh, do the IDs resolve to machine readable content? Do the IRIs resolve? So the, the WFO IDs, do they resolve to a machine readable content? Uh, yes. If, yes, if, if given the uh, adjacent or, or uh, um, Jason P. Okay. Uh, there is one more question, but I think we should take it towards end. I will read it right now so that other um, speakers also have time to reflect upon it. The general question is about from a mass consumer of taxonomy to all the producers, does the backbone have a readily available download and a CC by type of license for the XR? Uh, for the entire taxonomy that you produce, basically. I think because it's a general question, we can take it in the end discussion so that everyone can check. Thank you. That sounds That's good. That's all, I think, yes. All right, thank you, William. Our next speaker is Marianne LaRue. Um, she's the eFlora coordinator at the South African National Biodiversity Institute. Um, her presentation is a collective effort to update the legume checklist, and it is recorded. Hi, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to present the work that was done by the Legume Phylogeny Group's Taxonomy Working Group over the past year and few months. I will explain the structure of the working group, how the actual work was done, and what we have published to date. Towards the end of my talk, I will highlight the impact of our work in an ongoing case study by Jeebus. Names are central to scientific communication, linking data between research projects or allowing data flow from published research into online platforms or allowing communication among online data platforms. Names can be confusing because some scenarios cause multiple names to exist for a single taxon, for example, in the case of a widely distributed species or a taxon with high morphological variability. In other cases, a single name may be applied to multiple taxa. Continually changing taxonomies are also problematic. All of these scenarios complicate linking data and therefore a curated up-to-date species list for the legumes is important to support our own research, in particular, the collaborative work that the LPWG is planning around traits, occurrences and phylogenomics, but also to allow other scientists to answer applied research questions more easily. The International Legume Database and Information Service, or ILDIS, was an important online data source of legume information. However, this source hasn't been curated for more than 20 years and is now out of date. In 2019, Anne Bruno and colleagues published a paper outlining the need for an up-to-date new online species information system after some discussion in May 2020 on how this can be achieved, the Legume Phylogeny Working Group established five working groups to address and generate the content for this site. The Taxonomy Working Group was one of the five working groups established. We were tasked with creating an up-to-date community-endorsed checklist for all legumes. In order to achieve this, we had to find a starting list of names that was least out of date. We identified the world checklist of vascular plants and from here on referred to as WCVP as a good starting list and a collaboration with the World Botanic Gardens, Q, was set up 
working with Rafael Rowitz as the editor. We then had to find volunteers of tax farm experts to help check names. Any interested expert could join the group. We had an interim list published in February this year, and the official version was published in June. The Taxonomy Working Group also established an arbitration committee to deal with conflicting taxonomies if and when they arise. The structure of the group includes an overall coordinator, subfamily and tribe coordinators, and ultimately the contributors or taxon experts. Corrections and verifications to the lists of names are annotated by the contributors and collected by the coordinators who then submit consolidated information to the editor for incorporation into the WCVP database. Here I want to show the list of names the contributors checked. The list is rather extensive with 18 fields of data including a comments field where corrections are noted and a field to list the name of the person who verifies the record. This slide is a summary of the overall workflow we followed to publish the legend checklist. The brown orange block on the left is cross-cutting between the taxonomy working group and Q and refers to the process that I have just explained on the previous slide. The green block is mainly the responsibility of the taxonomy working group. The blue block is taken care of by Q and the red block is taken care of by GDIF. Focusing on the blue block, names in the WCVP database are cross-referenced with names in IPNI. Information in WCVP is disseminated through multiple platforms and at different time intervals. The legumes do not form part of the world checklist of selected plant families, but it forms part of the WCVP download that is published three monthly and is available on the WCVP um, website. However, the WCVP database includes more data than what is disseminated on the WCVP download. And therefore, Q generated a Darwin Core archive for the legume checklist. This was given to GBIF to upload onto the Catalog of Life's checklist bank. And it also feeds into the GBIF taxon taxonomy backbone and into the GBIF legume data portal. In total, 80 contributors and one editor worked together to create the first WCVP for basic checklist. The latest version of the legume checklist will always be available at the, at the link shown here, which is on the Catalog of Life's checklist bank. To date, the taxonomy working group has checked about 42% of all accepted legume genera. The subfamily Sarsidoidae and the Aliwoidae are complete, with 87% of the Dictariwoidae and several of the tribes in the large subfamily Papilinoidae also complete. The starting checklist had close to 86,000 names and 2,011 names were added. The graph on the right gives a percentage breakdown of the names from generic rank and lower that form part of the checklist. In total, 6,167 corrections were incorporated into the checklist. GBIF recently launched the online hosted portals. All of these portals focus on serving data for regions across the world, except for the legume data portal, which focuses on a specific taxonomic group. The WCVP for basic checklist on the Catalog of Life's checklist plan directly feeds into the legume data portal and is also searchable here. GBIF wants to try and quantify the impact and importance of taxonomists in biodiversity data. 
They have taken a snapshot of the GBIRS legume backbone before the February interim checklist was incorporated. And, in, and after incorporation, another snapshot was taken. A total of 22,110 names were unmatched prior to the legume update. And this number was reduced to 13,579 after the February update. Therefore, 38% of the unmatched names in the Jeep of Backbone was clean and correctly linked through this legume community effort, showing the important role of taxon experts. We will repeat this process in 8 October to continue measuring the impact. Hopefully, after several iterations of back and forth name checking, the legume checklist and the, B and the G birth legume checklist will start to converge. The Taxonomy Working Group is now also the official taxon expert network for World Flora Online, and our checklist will soon be incorporated into the World Flora Online backbone. There is still a large amount of work left to do, and the listed subfamilies and tribes on this slide still need checking. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marianne. Nick, do we have questions? No questions yet. I'm a bit curious um, how, how this community of experts is um, coordinated. I'm, that's your job apparently. Um, and I'm curious how you have done that and how you plan to keep it up. Um, so the legume community in general have been very active um, with working together for several years. We have a legume conference, international legume conference that we host, um, I think it's three or four yearly, um, since the 80s. Um, yeah, so through that, through that platform, I think we have generated a strong um, feeling of community and also through all our special um, issues that are through the advances in legume systematics, we've also built and worked together to create this community. We have our own magazine, The Bean Bag, that we publish. And um, yeah, and it's been an interesting experience getting people to work together on this checklist. Um, I think certain areas in the world have been excluded for um, I don't know what reason, and we've tried to be more um, incorporating everyone that feels that they have something to offer um, to help check this checklist. So we've been communicating via emails, trying to distribute the message that any legume expert that's interested to help us to contact me. And now we also have the legume data portal and taxonomy working group page where they can find our information and um, we will try to maintain this um, community. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, um, I think having the, the person to help coordinate is, is probably the biggest challenge because you do kind of need a point person. And it does take a lot of time to, to coordinate these activities, the communication to maintain that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. especially in a, um, when you're looking at a global group, um, trying to have meetings and schedule things so that everybody can participate. Uh, it can be very challenging. So I appreciate that. And we also have, um, I mean, all the work wasn't done by me. We have coordinators at tribe level and at subfamily level to try and take away some of that um, continuing work from a single person. Yeah, takes a village. <laughs> Excellent, any more questions? No? Okay, um, our next speaker is Cam Webb from the University of Alaska Museum of the North. 
and he will be talking about integrating taxonomic names and concepts from paper and digital sources for a new flora of Alaska. Thank you, Teresa. Just testing, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Great. Um, yeah. Good morning from a chilly day in Alaska. Uh, sun's still not quite up yet. Um, uh, and thank you for inviting uh, us to share some of our progress assembling lists uh, for this Alas new Alaskan flora. There's a uh, large team working on this new flora, but our group here at the ALA Herbarium is responsible for taxonomic informatics and for linking out to various online resources. The new Alaska flora is long overdue. Uh, the last comprehensive treatment was published over 50 years ago by Eric Haltain. I think most of the steps we're passing through during this work are fairly generic to any team generating a name list, whether it's for a taxonomic backbone or just for a local checklist. Uh, and I hope some of you will find our workflows and solutions useful for your own work. Uh, the, um, the broad steps uh, can be seen here in the diagram at the bottom of this slide. Uh, we started by compiling separate name lists for floras and other biodiversity informatics resources. The names in these different sources then need to be matched, which is a harder problem than it may seem at first. The product was a comprehensive list which provides a basis for taxonomic review by experts, which, are, which is still on, ongoing in our case, uh, and their decisions will determine the final list of taxa for our new flora. A less common part of our project was also to work with taxonomic concepts, the particular meaning of a name by a person or a community. I'll explain more about this later. Uh, I'd like to mention that there's a list of references at the end of these slides, and you can access the PDF for these slides via a list on my profile at Hoover. Alaska's flora provides a nice case for developing elements of this workflow. It's not too big, only about 23,000 taxa, but it's still challenging, especially uh, because of the history of taxonomy in the area. The first step was again to obtain source name lists. Most of these are online and instantly accessible. However, one key resource, Haltain's Flora of Alaska, required digitization. I hacked together a set of shell scripts that use the versatile image magic tools to slice up each scan page into maps, illustrations, and text blocks. The text was then OCR'd using Tesseract. One of the trickiest parts and most fun was to extract the points from the specimen dot maps and convert these into longitudes and latitudes. I then wrapped the resultant data up in a simple web app to display each taxon. You can see the product at this URL. Other resources we have integrated or plan to integrate uh, are local checklists at ALA and ACCS, the Alaska Center for Conservation uh, Science, the Panarctic Flora, the Flora of North America, and then for non-taxonomic resources uh, for specimens at uh, the ALA herbarium here, uh, and also from G uh, GBIF, and we plan to also in include uh, photos and observations from iNaturalist. The first step uh, of the assembly uh, is, to, is to take the full list of names from all the different sources, uncleaned and unreconciled, and blast them into the global names resolver of the Global Names Architecture Project. We got back a long list of possible matches with identifiers or GUIDs used in their respective sources. Where possible, we wanted to anchor each name to an external resource with a stable GUID. We cached the names from three root resources as I refer to them. These are resources with names that are anchored in primary literature and which have not been recycled through other names resources. I assembled this figure by reading the about pages in each of the major online names resources, and I think it's uh, more or less correct. You can see that uh, many name servers incorporate the output of other servers upstream of them. Our first choice was IPNI, uh, followed, which is the International Plant uh, Names Index, followed by Tropicos, and then the QWell checklist of selected plant names, uh, plant families, uh, WCSP. The next step was to reconcile the Tropicos names to the IPNI names, keeping both identifiers, but using the particular variation of the name found in IPNI. Then we matched the names in WCSP to the reconciled set from IPNI and Tropicos, creating a growing set of canonical names and GUIDs. 
There was no tool that would quite do what I needed, so I wrote a small command line program called Match Names to locally compare one list of names to another. The tool incorporates some basic botanical uh, logical, uh, basic botanical taxonomic logic, which will recognize and allow missing base synonyms, missing in and x, and handle simple punctuation mismatches. It then, it then searches the reference list for candidates using fuzzy matching and presents these to the operator for human decision, which it uh, then records. The inclusive set of possible names from uh, these canonical sources contained nearly 1,400 names from IPNI, uh, 5,000 from Tropicos, and fewer from WCSP. I then started matching names in our own uh, target data resources to this list, starting with the ALA checklist, Panarctic flora, flora of North America names, and Haltane. Once the various taxonomic resources were reconciled, uh, it was possible to compare accepted names and synonyms among them to see where the, the sources have differed in opinion. I generated a single comprehensive clash list highlighting these similarities and differences. Here's a snippet. Uh, for example, you can see that the first name in, um, is an accepted name according to the Q list, but a synonym according to FNA and one of our local checklists. The clash list is a handy resource for the taxonomic expert review phase. Having linked and compared taxonomic data resources, we're now working on reconciling the names of specimens and observations in the same way. Shifting gears now, I want to share some of our work on taxonomic concepts. During taxonomic revision, revisionary work, often a name is preserved, uh, but its meaning, that is its circumscription or taxonomic concept, changes, making data integration by name alone inaccurate. This is a perennial problem in biology and much discussed at TADWIG and ID bio meetings. One obvious solution is to record the particular taxonomic usage of a name, referencing the name plus the publication wherever a scientific name is used. The terms sensu or sec uh, are often used for this. Aligning or mapping related uh, taxonomic concepts then provides uh, taxonom taxonomy users with a guide for better understanding the meaning, the meaning of names. We wanted to align taxonomic concepts in five key resources for the Alaska flora. Haltane's flora, Welsh's flora, Cody's flora of the Yukon, the flora of North America, and the Panarctic flora. While it may seem at first that extensive botanical experience is needed to do taxon uh, concept mapping, we believe that actually the work is primarily the making of careful logical inferences from text, and we wanted to see if a non-specialist could do this. We're excited that this seems to be true. Kimberly Cook, who you may even have met last night, she was the host of the pub, of the pub quiz, uh, was not a botanist nor a taxonomist when she started working with us last year on taxonomic concept mapping, but she learned quickly and has achieved a great deal. Whenever possible, she reviewed her alignments with local botanists who have experience both with the plants and with the written floras, and Kimberly's inferences were very close to their own. Please see Kimberly's ID BioTalk for more about this process. To assist Kimberly in keeping track of the complex mess of publications, names, concepts, and alignments, I made a special database and web app called T uh, TCM. Kimberly generated uh, 482 taxonomic concept relationships among 557 taxonomic concepts in 13 of the largest and most complex plant genera in Alaska. Here you can see a particularly complicated case in Papaba, the poppies. We came up with a way of visually representing taxonomic concept relationships using graph viz. In these diagrams, different line styles indicate the kind of relationship. For example, a dashed line with an arrow means is included in. We found that these graphical representations are fairly intuitive and they helped us discuss Kimberly's mappings with local experts. Finally, I briefly want to mention some ongoing work for sharing the results of taxonomic concept alignment. But our ALA specimen data is managed in the Arctos database and we wanted to be able to include taxonomic concept information on top of basic name information. Dusty McDonald, the lead developer, kindly added some new tables and user interface elements to be able to store these and also to be able to identify a specimen to a concept, not just to a name. How then do we share taxonomic concept data among databases? Well, this has been possible to do in a standardized way since Tadwig published the Taxonomic Concept Transfer Schema, TCS, in 2005. I just wanted to mention an ongoing Tadwig 
project led by Niels uh, Klesenger to update TCS and convert it from an XML schema to a modern Tadwig style uh, standard. And you can go to uh, the interest group meeting beginning next month. So just a few uh, takeaway ideas on Checklist ass 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 assembly that stand out for me. First, it should go without saying that every statement in the checklist should contain a reference to its original source. Similarly, because taxonomic opinions have, have differed and will always differ, I think it's important in a checklist to preserve alternate views uh, on accepted names and their synonyms, again, re referencing back to the original publications. Linking all, external, uh, linking all names to external GUIDs where possible to root resources alleviates the burden of the checklist itself becoming the arbiter of correct form. And finally, I, I recommend making the construction of the checklist fully repeatable and transparent. The approach I use is writing documented shell scripts and storing these on GitHub. You can find uh, a link to our GitHub repo and blogs documenting various aspects of this project at our project website, alaskaflora.org. Finally, some thank yous. Um, this work has been uh, primarily funded uh, by a grant from the US National Science Foundation. Thank you to the many people who've directly assisted us, in particular, members of the new Flora of Alaska Executive Committee. Thanks to all who collect, uh, collected and collated the data that this work depends upon, and also to the many contributors to the software tools that we used. And last but not least, I'd like to remember with awe the great land now known as Alaska that makes all this botanical uh, research possible. And to remember the native Alaskan peoples who were in fact the land's first plant taxonomists. And to all you out in the ether, thanks for listening. Thank you, Cam. Okay. PJ, have, questions? Yeah. We have several questions for Cam. Uh, first one is from Yorit. Uh, how do you version and share your data products? Uh, for example, checklist and their uh, provenance for reuse and review. And the second part of the question is what would help to make it easier to publish and keep track of your data products? Thank you. Yeah. Um... So we, we uh, at, at the moment, it, the question about versioning, we, we, we actually haven't released the final checklist yet. So, uh, uh, but I, uh, we, we will, um, uh, there'll be versioning uh, in the GitHub repo in which it sort of starts out. Uh, and then uh, I think probably all these products will go into Zenodo, uh, which permits uh, ver versioning. Um, and then any, any place it goes out on some, uh, official site, the Florida Alaska site, it'll be have, have some version with it. Uh, I'm sorry, the second question was? Uh, the, the second question was how, uh, uh, what would help to make it easier to publish and keep track of your data models? Yeah, I, um, easier to publish. I, well, there's a million places we can publish. I think one of the big problems I think about a lot is discovery. Um, and where do you put these things such that they hang around? Um, and uh, there was a, you know, yesterday's session about uh, knowledge graphs is one way of going with this. Um, I, I do like Zenodo as a place that seems to be fairly permanent for leaving products. Um, uh, and um, yeah, but this is, a, this is a generic problem with making things uh, stick around. Thank you. Next question is, uh, is your clash list available for download? It is, yeah. There's a link to it uh, in the um, in the slides, and the slides are linked to on my profile on Hoover. Um, so it's it's also not an official product yet, but yeah, you can take a look and and, and see uh, where we stand on that. Okay, so I have a question: uh, What is your approach if and when uh, taxonomic concepts are not well defined in the literature? Yeah, and this is often the case. Um, We've, uh, we, there, there's five standard relationships that uh, have been sort of pioneered, Nico Franz's work, uh, and um, also used by uh, Alan Weekly. Um, and these are, these are, um, is in, includes, is included in, uh, overlaps, uh, is, is um, congruent with, and is disjunct from. We found that actually we end up using a, a more, uh, like a superset of um, relationships, which is simply intersects. 
and uh, says, you know, so we say that this concept intersects this because it has at least one specimen in common. Uh, and unfortunately, yeah, this, it's often uh, not possible to be more precise than that. Okay, one more question. Uh, could you share a bit more of your experience on how to involve non-experts uh, to work with taxon concept alignment cases and what are their backgrounds and will they have to know about uh, the more technical sides like RCC5 and possible words and uh, the more biodiversity expert side things like background about a particular species. Yeah, thank you. Um, so so in, in conversations about taxon concepts, one of the big uh, re re repeated ideas is that it's just too much work to do. Uh, and so uh, if we can get this work um, to be done by people outside the sort of trained taxonomist community, we, uh, it could make that more feasible. So that's why we tested working with volunteers initially, and then uh, we we worked with Kimberly, and it's been uh, it's been great. I, the, the key thing is is just um, close attention to detail and uh, consistent logical inference. And then we also um, what I didn't mention is that uh, all these decisions, at least the ones that are not simple, are then documented so they can be checked as to why a particular decision was made in that way. And, and these things are all these are all fairly trainable uh, things for um, for almost anyone. So I, I think there's a lot of potential for non-experts to work on this. One more question: uh, How do you link a specimen uh, to a concept if the specimen level only gives a name? Is each specimen just a sorry, just a taxon name usage, or can you map them to a concept with a reference? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. It's also a, a, a key a key problem for this is yeah most most specimens don't use concepts. Um, it, it's some con sometimes concepts can be um, assumed or inferred if there's a uh, you know a generic if you know a, a dominant flora that was used at a particular time in the past. Um, uh, so 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 using date as a guide to which concepts were used is is one way to do this. But uh, in the end, it may you know many of these are not recoverable to a concept in the past. The, the key thing is that going forward, more and more people actually cite a, a concept rather than just a name when they're identifying a specimen. I think that's all for the time being. Great. Great. Thank you. And uh, yeah, a big shout out to Kimberly for all the puzzle solving that she has been doing. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Cam. Our next speaker is David Mitchell, um, CITES Technical Information Specialist at the Integrated Taxonomic Information System, ITIS, and his talk, ITIS and the Global Taxonomic Backbone. Hi, uh, it's a pleasure it's a real pleasure to be here today, and I'm speaking from the foothills of the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains in Northern Virginia, and I acknowledge the Piscataway, Massawomack, and Manahoic indigenous peoples who are and have been of this land for centuries. So IDIS is a partnership, a partnership created in 1996 between government agencies in USA, Canada, and Mexico. The partnership was formalized under an MOU with the charter to develop, scientifically review, improve, and maintain a taxonomic information system. Uh, with that charter as the foundation, IDIS, as a foundation of IDIS, uh, the mission is set. Communicate a comprehensive taxonomy of global species that enables biodiversity information to be discovered, indexed, and connected across all human endeavors. So IDIS is global in scope, and although IDIS is funded by the US government, partnerships are not restricted to federal agencies. NGOs and educational institutions, for example, are welcome to join the partnership, which works together to establish uh, IDIS priorities. To accomplish the IDIS miss mission, IDIS partners with taxonomists across the world to assemble scientific names and their taxonomic relationships and then distribute that data through publicly available software. In so doing, we seek to provide a complete, current, and high quality automated taxonomy that is open, 
and can be delivered and integrated into systems across the world. The outcome of, of achieving this result, that this is our theory of change, is the increased utility of a mass biological data on a global scale. This change will happen because the association of organism names with biological information is almost universal and the informatics community is critically dependent on complete and accurate information regarding scientific names of organisms to organize the biological data and communicate the information about biodiversity. To help illustrate this charter mission, action, and impact chain, I'll highlight uh, some work that IDIS has recently done to add a global treatment of mosquitoes. A priority for our MOU partners in 2020 and 2021 was reviewing and updating various animals that serve as vectors for zoonotic diseases with an intent to mobilize data on species across the entire pathway of zo zoonotic disease risk and spread. One clear taxonomic priority for IDIS uh, because of their severe human impact was an updated mosquito treatment. And in support of a collaborative research effort examining climate-induced phenology shifts of mosquitoes, IDIS had a global treatment of coolicity. The IDIS treatment will be used to help assemble various mosquito occurrence data sets targeting species from across the United States into a single national scale data resource. Such an integrated data set is critical for asking if there were if there will be human human increased, if there will be increased human exposure, I should say, to species that impact human health. I just assembled the treatment uh, from two primary sources and made the effort to include many homotypic synonyms with an emphasis on our alternative combinations that uh, of species known to be disease vectors. Uh, this will help connect the plethora of alternative combinations we found in the literature to biodiversity data inside those biodiversity systems. Now, once data is entered into IDIS, there are several ways to access it. And there, all of our data is licensed CC by zero. You can perform a web search on our website just to do a quick uh, you know, look up of our scientific name. You can download our data in several formats, including Dar Darwin Carr Archive, our own custom format, the TWV you see there, or you can simply download the entire database and we do make it available in several database formats. We have RESTful services in the form of an API, which returns data in, in a consistent format, and there's no registration required to use our API. We also make available a queryable solar index. So through our development activities, delivery mechanisms, and our network of taxonomic collaborators, I just provide services across the sector, across sectors such as the US government, the bioinformatics community, the academic and commercial world, and education. I just, for example, works closely with the US Fish and Wildlife Service on taxonomic and nomenclatural issues impacting endangered species that are listed underneath the endangered species, US Endangered Species Act, and species that are included inside uh, CITES. And IDIS is also committed to making sure its open data is available and performs well in open source tools, such as the R tools, R Taxize, and R IDIS. I'll focus next on our relationship with uh, the Catalog of Life. So IDIS is a full partner with Species 2000, which generates the Catalog of Life. Now, Species 2000 was initiated in 1996 as a task group under TADWIG. The partnership between IDIS and Species 2000 represents the most comprehensive effort to produce a single global list of named species. To create the catalog, a network of taxonomists from around the world contribute Global Species Databases, or GSDs. A GSD represents a complete global perspective of the species included in the taxon at the time of the GSD's completion. Currently, Catalog of Life is compromised of about 160 data sets, totaling 1.9 million, million species. And those species are linked together uh, via a management hierarchy to create a single data set. 
As the catalog of life modernizes its processes of list creation and expands its own network, the content gaps will be filled and its timeliness or how up to date it is will be enhanced. This will benefit supported infrastructure like GBIF and the Encyclopedia of Life who will be able to reduce reliance on custom processes at their own end uh, to fill in those gaps. And so we'll hope to see those inconsistencies uh, be uh, kind of eliminated since they impede interoperability between those data infrastructures. Finally, at IDIS, uh, maintaining relationships with taxonomists and the data providers and the people subscribing to our data is a core activity. So I want to conclude by letting everyone know how you can partner with us. First, you can follow what we're doing on our news page. You can see the link there. If you have a question or find a problem with data, email us. If you are a maintainer of a GSD and would like to be a contributor, you know, contact us and we can definitely talk. IDIS is currently also looking for beta users uh, to provide feedback on the taxonomic workbench 6.0. That is our, our new data maintenance platform. And it's our it's a new co-creation platform that will open up the IDIS data quality lifecycle to the to the con to the basically the GSD providers that we have. The feedback will be used on the application that we received, the feedback will be used to prioritize and direct some of the final stages of development before the initial release of the software. And finally, if your organization is interested in continuously improving the taxonomic information within the IDIS database, uh, consider becoming a partner with us. That is my short presentation, Teresa, I guess. Uh, Back to you. Great, thank you. Do we have any questions? We do have one question. Uh, the first part of the question is, who designs your slides? <laughs> I <guess> they <laughs> like the design of your slides. <laughs> uh, that's a custom effort for me. Yep, so that's this is authored by me. They're also CC by zero as well. You can. I'll make them available my profile so you can download those and, and see the photo credits. Okay, more serious question. The uh, second part to this is given the graph that Cam showed about the flow of data through all the various tax on name providers, how important is having one GUID for one tax on name or can we settle for a web of GUIDs? Well, um, I I can take yeah. that, David. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, this is Tom Orley. I'm the uh, co-author on that talk, um, if you will. Uh, I think following Cam's talk, uh, but also in general, um, in the GUID world, really pass through is important. So there can there could be multiple GUIDs for the same name, possibly multiple concepts would have different GOIDs. But uh, with for, for, for the way IDIS has always done it, our data is, they're not globally unique, they're unique within the, the system itself, itself. And they are persistent. We don't ever get rid of them. So they, even if we change the spelling, the concept, those things will resolve to what the current view is. So I guess to me, uh, and spending a lot of time in the PID, GOID world, um, simply having infrastructure that works is the number one thing that's important. We can always resolve multiple GIDs with like as statements and in, in, in a, an information graph. So I personally don't think having multiple GIDs is, is a problem. Ultimately, you know, you know, it would be nice if we had a single GID for every name that's out there, but I just don't think that's realistic. So, um, from a catalog of life perspective, I think, and this goes back to how catalog of life is, is currently, uh, G is the backbone for GMIF. Uh, that was maybe not clear in our talk, but, but we, we not only are working with GMIF, we are GMIF in many ways. I think there is an effort there to kind of unify that GOID process. And I think that will go a long way towards uh, Cam's, Cam's comments. 
I don't know if that makes sense, but but uh, and I can expand uh, off offline if somebody wants to. Yeah, I think we had a question by Carlos Martinez. Uh, he's going to give it by microphone. So go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for the talk. Um, I was going to ask if you have a memorandum of understanding already with Scratchpads, because probably, as you know, Scratchpads is using the ITIS data model for input of taxonomic names. So I think that basically any name that we have is interoperable. So I'm, I'm running a database on myriapods, on centipedes, millipedes, and so. And if those names can flow directly into ITIS, well, I'm happy with that. Like in 2020, we had around 200 new species of myriapoda and onychophora in the world. So, and uh, one thing that I was going to say, I don't know if the model has improved over time, but if it has, then please um, tell the, the developers uh, of Scratchpads in London, because for example, I remember that one of the things that I see the most is that we have this dichotomy of valid and invalid names, but that's not the highest level. So we have unavailable names, which is over that dichotomy. And this is not correctly implemented in the system as it should be in the Scratchpad side, but maybe it's a documentation problem. So if I can help in any of these, I'm taxonomist, I have experience in nomenclature, so I can certainly help. Uh, yeah, thank you. And that's really good to hear. I mean, we don't formally have an MOU yet with scratch pads, but um, it, it sounds like we could uh, at least start with some type of data exchange. And I can share with you like how it would work today and how we expect it to work tomorrow with our new co-creation platform that's coming up. Thanks, and, and I would, I would add that that would be a great way to move forward. Was uh, you know basically some sort of formal pipeline with the new uh, platform that would allow people who are using scratch pads to connect directly. And that was how we designed this uh, to to understand that there are people that use our model directly, but there's also other workflows. Uh, the idea is along with uh, Taxon Works, Aphia at Worms, and Itis's Catalog of Life, we would have three co-creation platforms that would allow taxonomists to go directly in the catalog of life via those three pathways without having to maintain their own infrastructure. So ultimately we're trying to build the community, the tools that are necessary to do the work that you need to be able to get to where you want to be without having to maintain that infrastructure. And that was really the point of doing it. We Excellent. do have two more questions on the Whova app, but maybe we want to move on for time and we'll handle those offline. Yeah, or we can handle them after the next presentation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Our next speaker is Beckett Sterner, Assistant Professor at Arizona State University. Um, his talk is Wanted Standards for Fair Taxonomic Concept Representations and Relationships. Hi everyone, thanks for uh, making it to the end with us. Um, and it's been really great to see the other talks, thanks to the organizers of the symposium. Uh, I especially see resonances with Jacob Butz's talk and Cam Webb's uh, for what we're gonna cover here. And this is kind of um, uh, me talking about a group project um, uh, coming out of a proposal led by Nate Upham, uh, focused on mammal species of the world, uh, the sort of next generation, what that, what that might look like. I'm not gonna really talk directly about um, the, the mammal species part of it, but sort of an idea that came out of it related to uh, fair data. So get in touch with Nate too, if you wanna to hear more about that side. So um, the kind of larger problem that we were trying to tackle uh, together is this issue of if we're collecting data for the long term to understand biodiversity change over time, well, then you also need to take care of it uh, for the long term. And it, for a given data set, um, as the categories change that we use to label and make these observations meaningful also change, um, then the, the labels become increasingly ambiguous with time. Um, and the number of records that are actually accurately identified uh, go, is gonna go down um, because the meanings of the labels are shifting, but the labels themselves may not be updated. And part of the, there's a sort of systemic issue here that we're trying to think about how to find our way out of um, where you have um, people publishing data on the bottom left of this figure here, uh, such as Arctos, like Kim uh, Webb was talking about, 
Um, but oftentimes um, there is the resources or the, the legacy data to uh, provide exactly that according to that designates a particular concept that the, the identifier had in mind when they said, um, this is you know, this species of mammal. And then uh, this gets pushed up and merged in ways that can then create new issues as you're trying to combine data sources that are impartially or incompletely labeled according to multiple different sources. Um, and nonetheless, it has value by giving you sort of this bigger picture that um, kind of has important signal in it. Um, and when it gets used by species experts um, that are really trying to drill down and understand what's going on with any given species, they're doing a lot of cleaning and curating of this data, but then it you know, ends up in reports or publications or in local databases, and we don't complete the loop there. And so it's not going back to help the data publishers improve uh, what they're up to. And so everyone has good reasons for sort of what they do individually, but then we kind of get into the systemic uh, uh, sticking point. And so is there a possible way out? Um, and part of uh, the, the core idea for, for the proposal um, and thinking about mammal species in particular, um, but, but hopefully with general uh, significance, is to go beyond uh, taxonomic intelligence as a project of linking the names of species to the concepts um, that they, uh, you know, um, they give them their meaning. And to try and uh, you know, uh, level up and say taxonomic intelligence should also help us tell how concepts apply to data. So can we curate information about the meaning of these species names, um, to, how to operationalize the concepts that go with, a, with them, that we can then apply to improve the labels and their accuracy and their precision um, on the original observational records. And so you can imagine here on the left here, we start with the generation of an occurrence record as an evidence of an organism out there in the world. Um, and it can be preserved in multiple different ways. Um, it gets linked through nomenclature um, to particular taxonomic treatments, type specimens, and names. Um, and the community has been pushing to associate um, the, those names with concepts, trying right? to keep track of which name goes with which concept and you know, was used to identify the specimen. But there are these things that actually tell us what the concepts are, how to apply them, how to use them, um, that we haven't yet brought into the picture. And that's uh, where we're trying to go here. And where we think could really open a, uh, up a new role for taxonomic authorities and bridge this gap in the feedback loop that I was describing. And so this is the, the pending proposal we've submitted on mammal species of the world next uh, that Nate led. Um, and uh, the idea here is to extract and curate authoritative information about what the mammal species names mean that we can then use to apply uh, with computational methods to actual observational records, the occurrence records. And um, this can unlock a number of different benefits for each of the different uh, stakeholders that I was describing here. Um, I'm gonna keep going just for the sake of time. Uh, but one of the use cases we had in, in mind here is uh, a split in 2019 of the um, mouse species Paramiscus maniculatus. And uh, the maniculatus originally spread all the way up from this orange bit here through the, the medium blue and the green and then down into the Sonoran Desert. Um, and then Greenbaum 2019 said these are in fact five, this range corresponds to five different species. And so in one fell swoop, 250,000 GBIF records are affected by this split um, and have become uh, ambiguous and potentially incorrect, right, or inaccurate um, if you just use the name Paramiscus maniculatus. And this has um, sort of downstream implications as um, this species uh, in some sense, uh, unclear, uh, uh, does seem to be, for example, a potential reservoir for COVID-19. And so there's an experimental study that um, provided some initial evidence for this, but they were using paramiscus maniculatus without paying attention to the split. And so sort of illustrates the importance. Well, um, these maps, right, that are in this publication that I'm showing here is in, in PDF form um, can actually help us update any of the records that do have um, uh, geo-coordinate information with them or locality information we can turn into latitude and longitude. And so if we go to the, the original Greenbaum 2019 and extract those maps as GIS layers, um, we can then apply this representation of the new concepts, the map, uh, to the geo-reference data and uh, computationally update 
the record with an accurate and, and current uh, concept label. And uh, we've um, been playing around with ways that AI can help us uh, make inferences about some of the uh, data records that are outside the map ranges or potentially um, uh, have uncertainties that fall along the boundaries here. Um, and our graduate student at ASU and our group, Caleb Powell, uh, is working on a manuscript that will say more about that. So um, keep an eye out for that coming soon. And um, you know, the core idea here goes beyond just uh, maps of the species ranges. We can also think about um, a broader suite of ways to represent taxon concepts in operational uh, ways, um, especially reference gene sequences, um, photographic images, which I think a number of groups like the reptile, reptile database are already pulling in from iNaturalist. But if we can sort of curate them to a specific concept, um, there's potential uh, application of that curated data set to identify few uh, future observations to the concept level resolution. And then I, I also want to um, make a mention of important work that's been going on and sort of precedes us here in terms of diagnostic traits and trying to extract those and, and annotate them using an, uh, anatomy or phenotype ontologies. And I think we're, we're sort of building on that and taking it into new modes of data, new modes of representing what the concepts mean. And so with that kind of use case in mind, um, what I was sort of motivated to, to do here is to make a call um, for thinking about what we would need to do uh, to make these operational representations of, of taxonomic concepts uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, right? So this is something that lots of different taxonomic authorities and uh, folks curating backbones um, are often already curating in some fashion or collecting, um, but aren't be, uh, being provided in digital form in ways that could be computational part uh, read and, and, and uh, interpreted. And so something like the current um, taxonomic concept schema goes partway toward this, um, but doesn't uh, currently address like what would it mean to have a range map as part of your taxonomic concept uh, information that you've curated. Um, and also um, not just or going beyond just the publication of revisions um, to include uh, some of the additional improvements and curation that could happen in, um, for example, mammal species data and which isn't currently technically inside of the, the scope of TCS. Um, so anyway, um, we'd be excited to talk more. And um, uh, Jacob Butz's idea of the bio curation workshop sounds um, potentially really neat there to connect on this. And so I wanna say thanks to our group, um, many of whom are over here on the right and to funding sources from uh, ASU and an NSF grant. Great, thank you, Beckett. Do we have any questions? Uh, yes. So one question we have is uh, uh, the peromiscus example works due to the allopatric speciation. Uh, how can this approach be used in more complex cases that may constitute a, which, which actually may constitute a majority of cases? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's definitely going to vary from group to group. So mammals may be more allopatric in their relationships than um, insects or plants, for example. Um, I think that's uh, partly why um, having multiple ways of representing concepts are going to be helpful, right? So um, if you have an image and uh, a location, but the location gives you an ambiguity, um, if you also have a curated set of images, you can apply that as well and kind of bring two perspectives to bear to try and calibrate. Um, I also, I mean, sort of at the highest level, if we had, uh, if, if all the range maps only got us 30% of all mammal data labeled to concept level resolution, I think that's actually a huge win um, from the get-go and something that we can build on top of. Um, so even partway is, I think, really valuable. And then having the different perspectives can take us further. OK, uh, there is one more question. Uh, how did you deal with the unequal samples, if any, in your training data set? Yeah, um, let me think. So the way that this worked, and, and Caleb will ultimately be the person um, I, can, I can pass you along to for the technical details. Um, the way this worked is that we 
initially assigned uh, records to each of these updated species concepts um, according to whether they fell inside of the range within the, the uncertainty. And that's sort of why each of these ovals and circles are, are labeled according to color. Um, and then we took that as a training set to say, here are characteristics, for example, uh, using environmental data or physical data uh, reference to each of those specimens that we can apply to specimens that are, were uh, continue to be uncertain about. And so this is sort of a way of extending outward um, from current data sets to the ones that uh, don't necessarily fall in the range maps. Um, I, think, I think Caleb may have um, subsampled to handle the, the balancing issue, but I'm not positive off the top of my head. Um, but I'd ha be happy to put uh, you in touch with him uh, if you'd like uh, to, to um, get the details there. I think there are other questions are for like generally all the panelists or there is a specific question for David. So I think now uh, since we do not have any specific question on this, we can open the floor and can handle maybe the general questions. So the question for David is, uh, how do you track usage of the usage of and uh, references to uh, specific versions of ITs? What information value, uh, what information slash value do you get from the usage statistics? For, yeah, we do track some se several usage statistics, including uh, the number of ITIS downloads that we receive and we, of our database, all the way to the number of individuals that are using our website. Um, and we are, the, the government is the, yeah, and we do track those to sort of evaluate our impact. And those are, you know, evaluated. Uh, we get a lot of use through our API as well. And we have not only a static API, but we also have a solar index. And so we track the number of uh, basically the number of calls against both of those. Uh, there is one more question. Given sequencing is a very common data product associated with species. Are there any plans to work with uh, NCBI taxonomy group to bring that into the line with ITIS? Um, if Tom's on the call, he might be able to, I believe in CBI taxonomy is uses catalog of life, but Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I would say that uh, being, uh, my background is in both zoology and also microbiology. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily see those two things as always being congruent. Uh, the, the NCBI taxonomy has to deal with things that, that often don't, haven't gone through the description process so they're much more, or they're much less uh, formal in the process they use for taxonomy. ITIS is about uh, well-established, uh, defendable, published uh, uh, taxonomies. So um, if anything, ITIS might appear within NCBI, but I don't usually think it goes in the other direction. Uh, the same is to be said with how NCBI appears in GBIF. We pull from them, uh, in many ways to, uh, when I say GBIF, that's Catalog of Life and GBIF. Uh, we pull from them for uh, aligning some data. We do use them for, uh, I think, some protease, protozoa, things that, that may not have uh, a lot of data in a, a formalized sense. Uh, obviously, moving forward, dealing with uh, sequence data as the only way to resolve information is, is the infrastructure that we're looking at. But that would not appear on ITIS. ITIS is specifically uh, about uh, published and things that have gone through the formal description process. So they're really different pathways to getting to information. I think that's all for this group. Now there are a couple of general questions. I will also read it, but I'm also pasting them in the uh, in the Zoom chat. So all the 
all the speakers can really read them because they are kind of long. So uh, one of the questions is uh, uh, for taxonomic work, biologists contributing to regional taxonomies who are not trained taxonomists seem to often ignore the extreme importance of scientific name authorship. Could this, uh, could the speakers comment on this issue, explain why it is a problem and how it can be better addressed? Again, I can, I can jump in on that. Um, having, having the authority, the, the authorship correct, allows people to get to uh, the original literature often if that isn't uh, explicitly put into a link for taxonomic information, but it also allows for that concept to be understood. It goes back to the original description of the, of the, the circumscribed specimens often. Uh, and if we get that wrong, then that leaves somebody has to go through and do that work. And I, and I know, for example, in um, uh, the mammal species of the world, the, the earlier volumes, there was epithets published with, with some names, but there wasn't full combinations. So in order to re resolve subsequent combinations, somebody has to have some knowledge or go back to the literature. So being explicit as to the, the concept and, and authorship in, at each step is, is really important. And I think it also um, allows for people to resolve where there's a conflation of a chrysonomy, a chrysonomies, if everybody knows what a chrysonomy is, it's basically a usage of a name with a particular um, authorship versus the authorship of that name. And those things sometimes in list development get confused. So you end up with a taxon, uh, you know, an epithet with six or seven different authors. And somebody has to go through and figure out which was the actual author and which was a chrysonymic author. So that's, that's another issue where the taxonomic world is, is, you know, it's really our duty to resolve these problems. And I think uh, the, the Global Names Index pointed this out pretty well in some of the work that they did early on. If people are familiar with that project. Uh, and also going back to UBIO at uh, Woods Hole, uh, it was, was really important to see that, that, that you could start to tease apart the actual author versus a crescentimic author. There is, a, in some sense, a follow-up question. Uh, mammal species of the world lacks full alterna alternative combinations. Is there a plan, for example, to include full binomial or homotypic synonyms? I have Maybe to punt on yeah, Nate and yeah. So I don't know if Nate is still here. Oh, okay. He might have had to leave, but yeah, I have to punt on that, unfortunately. Uh, we are planning to incorporate updates and a lot of the curation work has been happening with the mammal diversity database um, since mammal species of the world hasn't been issuing volumes recently. Um, but we are hoping to improve and, and expand on the nomenclatural information there, but I couldn't, uh, I don't know the details. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, what recommendations do you have for collection managers and their collection software developers who manage uh, determination uh, data, but are also um, feel pressure to update their scientific names such that their data products are assumed to be best made uh, discoverable via GBIF using Darwin core terms or uh, linear uh, hierarchies. It's a long question, so I'll also post it in the chat for people to completely understand and try to respond. I can I'll say respond something. a little bit that um, everybody should come see my talk tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, um, and I can sort of build on that because um, in the proposal that we're working on, we were collaborating in part with Teresa and Arctos um, to uh, explore how the uh, computationally generated re-identifications of a specimen with a concept label could then be fed back uh, into the Arctos database. Um, and so without necessarily erasing or losing track of what the original determination had been. Um, and so I think that's uh, potentially like an exciting option, potentially, right, to at least be able to say, here is what uh, this updated 
automated approach would say the new identification is you don't have to lose what you had before, but um, you could choose to serve it under that new ID um, for uh, aggregators such as GBIF. Anyone else wants to add this? I think Deb has uh, her hand right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Beckett, in that vision or anybody else, how does that fit with the, the human part of the loop where um, depending on the uh, updates to the names, some of those names uh, being updated may necessitate that the specimens themselves be looked at again. If something's been split, for example, and somebody's got to go look at the specimens to decide which in the categories those might fall into, how do we do a potentially better job of, I was lucky enough to have an expert come and visit my collection and evaluate those. And so now I have that updated information. How do I let, and maybe this is to you too, Teresa, I guess I'm trying to say, how can we do a better job of sharing expertise? Um, if anybody can think of that. Yeah. Uh, if I uh, uh, can answer uh, my idea about it. Uh, I think that uh, one thing we can do about this is uh, like if we have a specimen and uh, we have uh, um, you know matrix of uh, features for specimen uh, uh, like characters um, we can uh, do like first uh, degree approximation automatically uh, you know like um, uh, what uh, uh, I forgot uh, his name now. Yesterday's talk um, uh, about um, having uh, automatic um, uh, classification of species uh, through characters. I, I think that would be uh, very cool if we have enough characters uh, for a specimen and uh, something suddenly changed. So we have a new set of characters and by these characters we can split automatically huge uh, swaps of uh, data, like for example, these mice, uh, they could be, uh, you know, split uh, automatically in many cases, I think. Yeah, and I think so to address this, so for instance, if through this automated process, uh, we have a bunch of mice that are re-identified um, and then we have an expert actually come in and look at the mice, and either confirm or deny that um, the ability to include that information in your identification. So this was made by whomever and here's the process they did it um, allow, would allow us to stack those IDs. Um, and the, the expert doesn't necessarily have to do anything to the automated ID, they just create their own that happens to be the same as the automated one. And then that shows me, okay, an automated process and an expert have agreed that this is the ID. Maybe that's the one I should accept versus the 10 other IDs that might be on this one specimen. Yeah, and I think one, one reason that um, we, we were sort of thinking of uh, broader standards for how this could work is because um, if an uh, expert updates the ID or you know, adds a, a viewpoint on its, its classification and that either agrees with or disagrees with the automated method, that should come back into training data, right? And so the, the taxonomic authority um, can incorporate that feedback loop potentially um, to update the algorithm. Um, but that means that we're, it would be more of a continuous data set, right? Where it's curated to a concept perspective, um, but it's not, they might be inspired by, but not limited to the original publication that authored the concept. To, uh, to Deb's question though, I mean, I don't think we've, we've quite gotten to that exactly, but there might be uh, decisive specimens that would really challenge things if they were found to be disagreeing like along the border, you know, borders of different concepts. Um, so maybe there'd be a way to flag that as especially worth it, the attention of, of anyone who wanted to do identification work there. I think we have dealt with most of the questions. Uh, one question that we said we'll uh, revisit was this, uh, does the backbone have 
readily available, downloadable CC by type of license of uh, entire taxonomy file for each of your <laughs> data set or not is the is one question that remains and that also has like other implications of how easily the data could be downloadable if someone really wants the whole taxonomy for some purpose or the other. Yeah, um, and it was more of it was more of a basic question. We've had like I'm a compulsive merger of taxonomies. Um and one of the one of the issues we've had is just not being able to access the data for some reason or running into um sort of licensing problems uh since our parent organization and the um you know the backbone producer basically suddenly end up in a deadlock we've been trying to use um worms for a couple of years now and memorandums of understanding go backwards and forwards and sideways all the time as CSIRO and WORMS try to reach an agreement. So being able to just get something, have it well formatted and go, yeah, I can use this, is wonderful. Yeah, again, come to my talk tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd also, to everybody who took on the questions that we've just posed, this is great. Uh, and yay, Matt, what Matt just wrote, I kind of wanted to say what I'd also like to see at the same time is while we're interested in the valid, accepted, or most up-to-date taxonomic information, at the same time, if there is this area of question or there's this area of differences of, of um, ideas of how to group the groups, it would be great if at the same time we have these lists that facilitate discovery with the lists or the tools that help illustrate uh, the realities of identifying things and help uh, everybody, including the general public to understand uh, what the science of this is really like. Um, Anyway, just a plea for visualization of these different concepts. I don't think I need to give my talk tomorrow. You guys have already done it for me. <laughs> we should hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, well, I think we've uh, reached our time mm -hmm. limit here. So I really appreciate everybody uh, who spoke and asked questions. I think this is a topic that needs a lot of love and attention. So um, I really appreciate you all being here today. And we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. <laughs>